We are back. Welcome to the Leadership Launchpad Project. I'm Rob Kalvaroski, and again, Susan is off today. It's She's prepping for the long weekend, so there's a lot going on there. So we're giving her a break. And I have an incredibly special guest, the ma- mindful maverick herself, the host of <laughs> the Maverick Paradox podcast and also the Maverick Paradox magazine Jude Germain is here with us. Judith, how are you? I'm pretty good, thank you. I'm looking forward to today. Yeah, me too. And we chopped it up on your show a few weeks ago, and and now it's a pleasure to have you back on here. And so, obviously, I love to start these shows off with a quote, so I got one for us today. And it's from the Inuit Igjugarjuk. So... That's uh, hopefully I didn't, I mean, I did butcher his name, but here it is. (laughs) And he says, the only true wisdom lives far from mankind out in the great loneliness. And it can be reached only through suffering. Privation and suffering alone can open the mind of a man to all that is hidden to others. That is deep. It is, and maybe, what do you think about it? You know what, it it makes sense to me because the arrogance of man is that we have it all and we know it all. But when everything is stripped away, then you have to go deeper. And often that means going to a higher power, something outside of yourself, to look look for the wisdom. And I think if you're not, if you've never suffered, you don't really understand. You know, like in a basic way, like they say, um, like with doctors, until the doctor's been sick, he doesn't understand what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's that thing, isn't it? It's that if you if you have everything and you need nobody, what are you actually learning? I love that mm-hmm. and Obviously, it resonated with me. You know my story as well. Is is I had the darkness of depression for a long time, and it really was the reason for me to do the work on myself to evolve to the next level. And I don't think that ever... I mean, obviously, the journey never ends, but... It definitely was a huge catalyst for me. And it's something that we talk about on this show is turning that suffering into meaning. And so that's where we're going to start today. Now, we got to get into you, Jude. So obviously, (laughs) you're the mindful maverick. You have all these awesome things going on. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do? Okay, so I am considered the leading authority on Maverick leadership for my sins. Um, Specialise in leadership, change, culture, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I guess what I'm passionate about and what I do is I I create clear thinking and decisive leaders. um, And I do that through, oh, this humongous toolbox that I have. I'm very much an integrator going, you know, okay, this tool with that tool all creates this interesting thing. So it could be consulting, C-suite, mentoring, training, solicitation, um, all sorts of things. I think my real passion is about improving leadership capability and execution and helping people to understand that every single person is a leader whether you're sweeping the streets or whether you're the CEO, everybody is a leader and it's about bringing out that leadership and bringing it into a collective impact. And so what does leadership mean to you? Would it value if I said everything? <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think quite often people say, uh, you know, you go to work and you put your leadership cloak on and like, I am the leader. Whereas I think it's when you wake up in the morning and you put on your underwear, that makes you the leader. That is your leadership. It's so an integral part of who you are. That is the leadership. It's not 
the facade that you put on in the one place. So what if you don't wear underwear? <laughs> <laughs> It's even no. closer to you. You're going commando. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, I mean, you don't even think about being a leader. <laughs> yeah, oh that. yeah, it's definitely. Just, I totally agree with this, right? It, it's part of just your who you are, who you become, and that's the thing I think folks really need to integrate with is is who are you as the self, and what are the properties that that self has, and and totally would recommend if you haven't listened to it yet, go back a few weeks in the podcast and you'll hear from Dr. Richard Schwartz and we talk about self and and internal family systems and he's an incredible guy. So we'll just leave it there. I love that one. It was, it was the best. Now, what I want to know about is what's a maverick leader? Yeah. So a maverick leader is someone who recognizes that maverick leadership is about who you are so and what you do so who are you are you congruent um do you work with integrity are you trusted and trustworthy um do you have competence and the track record of what you do and i've got you know i love acronyms because that's my thing so i say maverick leaders they whine so w is for the willful intention H is for honest belief, I is for influential, and then N is for knowledgeable. Did you see what I did there? (laughs) And E is for execution and output driven, and S is for success driven. So Maverick Leaders whines, and it's a it's something that is innate, but other but you can you can learn how to to use these capabilities. I love that. And you you call yourself the mindful maverick. So what's how do you bring mindfulness into the maverick <laughs> leadership? I think that for me, mindful is in both of the common usages, right? So mindful in the sense of being purpose-driven and being aware that everything that you do impacts on everything else. So you're a role model, you role model parenthood, you um, how to be a partner, how to be a manager, how to be a follower, you role model all this. So you're mindful of the impact that you make uh, moving forward. And I think the other thing is about the mindfulness about being present. So it's a bit of a dichotomy. So I talk about looking in the future, but also the other side of uh, mindfulness is being very present and very focused on the present. And so you mentioned it, like looking into the future. What, how do you recommend leaders look into the future? Oh, the best way to do that is I always talk about being pathologically curious, <laughs> like a pathology, <laughs> in the sense that you are just eternally curious about absolutely everything. Um, and if you're going to be able to look into the future, you can't just look into areas that's in your specialism. You need to look at everything. You'd be able to, the only way that you can sense the, the wind of change and be that canary is to, is to start to listen to all the data points that you're picking up. Um, so that would be the first point for me is being aware of what's happening and looking in areas other than your specialism so you can see what's happening and then being able to backward, backward comply it and forward proof it. So I think that... I know I follow all these dichotomies, but that's, that's the maverickness of it. But I always, whenever I produce something for a client or or even myself, I always make sure that I can future proof it as much as possible. So you're building. So if you can, if you can affect the way that people think, they will be thinking forward rather than trying to think from implementation tool um, for something that's the present. Yeah. I'm not making any sense whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny that you mentioned the future um, of leadership and future proofing. It is, is something we've had talking about on this show before with William Adams was this element of in the future, given that we're implementing a lot of AI, the future of leadership is very going to be very person centric. Like, what do you see as the future of leadership? You know what? I have been pondering this for a long time because I have definitely got my eye on AI and machine learning. And it, and I'm sort of thinking, 
Hmm. Well, I have a job in the future when <laughs> these AI. What would leadership look like? And I'm thinking that the lead, it will become more about self leadership and more about the brain, how you as an individual marshal your own resources. Bearing in mind, you will not get a sense of identity through the work that you're doing. So if you're not getting identity through the work that you're doing, who are you? If if the work that you're doing is no longer required and there's nothing similar, how do you get paid? So how do you, so how do you deal with that huge loss of identity? And I think what makes it different is that whereas in the past low skilled workers were were replaced by the machine, now it's routine work. But that could mean bookkeeping. That could mean uh, data processing that could be teaching like there's countries that have got AI teaching children right now so it's skilled work as well and I think that's the shock I think that's going to be the shock because I think there's a lot of people out there thinking I'm not I'll be fine because I'm you know I'm an accountant or I'm a lawyer even like the data um, that lawyers have to pre-read that they'd get you know pupilish to do machines are doing that now um I'm not sure. So I'm uncertain to exactly what it would mean in the future. But I think if you can get good at marshalling your your thoughts, being able to think independently and to be able to uh, recognise the patterns of the past, but really read the future, you have a better chance of surviving as a leader. Because I think we're not going to be in a situation in the future where we're going to have loads of individuals who are reporting to us i can't see that happening <laughs> i thought you were gonna say if you could marshal the your command of the robot army you would be <laughs> <laughs> the thing is there is that but you won't need many people for that yeah because the leader of the ai will be the programmer right it won't be the middle manager it won't be the senior manager you know so it's a bit like if you think um of a factory when you was making cars and you had all those workers and then they were all replaced with like three robots. It's <laughs> going to be the same thing. And if AI can program itself, how many programmers do you actually need? And we already know that with the programming, we already do not know what AI are doing when they're, when they're reprogramming each other. You know, we've put two AI together and we said, talk to yourself and sort this out. And then the AI decided that English was no good and they made up their own language, <laughs> spoke to each other in their own language that no one could understand. And then they eventually turned the machines off because they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> now that's We've, a bit we've funny, seen this it? movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that. I'm thinking, oh no, it's going to be Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, I want to dig a little bit further, right? Like you're talking about self leadership and managing your own ideas. Identity, and it's something that I see a lot of leaders have is like I am, and it used to be me, right? Like I talk about on the show, like when I first met Susan, she asked me like, "Who are you?" And I said, "You know, I'm a engineer, I'm a water polo player, <laughs> and I'm an MIT graduate, right?" And it's like that's not you, that's your resume, that's what you've done. And so, what does that identity piece like look for folks like how how should they start breaking down who they are or separating who they are from what they do yeah that's a good question and I think that's going to be something that's going to be more far-reaching for at least our children's children if not our own children I think you have to start with values and beliefs and whether those values and beliefs are the ones that you have truly picked for yourself or whether someone has picked for you. And that's what I mean about marshalling your own resources because there are so many conformists who have an opinion on what they believe and what they value based on what somebody's told them is what they should do or what they've picked up from around themselves. So I think you need to the, maybe the first separate this is such a good conversation maybe the first separation is being absolutely certain that you know who you are 
I think it reminds me back when I was 20. I remember having a bit of a kind of a schism in myself when I suddenly realised that I was a different person, like a completely different person, depending on who I was with. So I was this person with my church friends and this person with my work friends and this person with my dance friends. And, and I got to the point of being completely lost. Who am I? And I thought if I had a party and they all came together, no one would get, like they wouldn't get on with each other because they, there'd be no commonality. And I had to work back into who is this one identity and, and re- making me behave slightly different in different scenarios rather than be different in each scenario. And that took a little while, but I was glad that I did it at 20 because I see people at 50 who have, have not reached that point. So separating uh, yourself is probably the first point, making sure you know what you believe in and interrogate what you believe in. So find people that don't agree with you and have a conversation and see and be willing to change your mind. I mean, I've noticed that a lot in my own podcast, I'll have a firm opinion on something. And then I'm, by the end of it, I'm like, okay, yeah, you're so right. Because <laughs> <laughs> you have to be that open to me, have you? Because you're not, you, you're only, you think you're right, but you might not be. And this is not about giving up deeply held beliefs. It's just going, I really, there's times on my podcast, I'll talk to somebody and I'll say, I don't like what you're saying and I really think you're wrong. But logically, following your argument, I can't hold that opinion because you seem like you're right and there's no flaws in your argument. Let me go away and work (laughs) that through. And quite often, there's something that I've held tightly to a belief system or, or a thought on something and I don't want it to be pulled apart because I've really identified with that thing. Um, but recognising that enables me to be more certain of who I am because I can then go back. Or, or sometimes it means by really thinking, I've doubled down on my belief because I've gone, actually, I now I know what's really trouble, troubling me with your argument and this is why. So, yeah, integrate yourself. <laughs> and that's the hard part, right, of the work. It's and and it does sometimes it's it is extremely painful because yeah some of those beliefs are what you believe you are yeah and you know what surround yourself with people that you know and trust that will tell you the truth I, I've got a lot of uh, mavericks around me who will t- give me a lot of hard truths and sometimes it's really painful but I know it comes from love and good intention. Um, and I know they would expect the same from me. So there's sometimes when I'm really, sometimes I'll go to a particular person and I'll be like, really don't want to talk to them because I know it's <laughs> going to be really painful, <laughs> but I know I need to hear it. But it's kind of like I save them up you know I mean? until I feel like I'm fit, strong enough. To, okay, tell me what you think about this. And they're like, <laughs> and then I'll fight them and then I'll go away and come and then I'll phone them up later and go, <laughs> but it, but it's a gr- great point, right? Is like it's so valuable to have these coaches or therapists or friends or mentors that are able to hold that space for you. And mm-hmm. I often call them mirrors of truth. Oh, I like that. Yeah, because often, I mean, it's obviously our eyes only look outwards, right? And so it's so hard for us to see what is actually us. And, and you know what? It's yeah, yeah. And if you, it's like the people I'm because of that, they're all socialized mavericks, so they don't just go blah blah. They're like, it's kind of this is what I did, or how about like this, or let's look into that. So it's not you're not being condemned for a wrong viewpoint or wrong action. It's like, let me get in, let me come into the hole with you. I've brought my own shovel and we'll figure a way to get you out, you know, and that's what I offer to people and that's what they offer to me. And I think that's the big difference because I'm not going for judgment. I'm like, this is this huge hole <laughs> or here's a small puddle. I don't know what to do. They're like, I'm going to say, can make room for me. I'm coming in too. And I think that's, that's how I like to mentor. And I'm sure that's similar to what you do. And I, I think that makes such a difference because it, it enables people to be vulnerable, enables people to, to trust what you've got to say and 
uh, really move forward um, in, in short order. I love that. And maybe like, how do we get to a place or how do we find those people who will actually get in the pocket and rumble with us? Oh, it's a good question. I write about this in my book a little bit where socialized mavericks or any maverick really takes a long time to trust people. And if they have it, you know, in the sense that, and they test the trust. So Here's a little bit of something. If you tell everybody about it, I can survive. I won't be happy, but I can survive. I want to see what's going on. <laughs> you know, so it's sometimes people trust too quickly. Or even if you feel like you you totally trust somebody, you're still, you still will test that trust. And it sounds like it's really manipulative, but I don't mean that. It's like, it's a bit like when you delegate. When you delegate something to somebody, you'd be foolish if you delegated everything because you don't know how they would handle it. So you delegate what you can deal with the consequences of, and that's the same with trust. And I think, you know, if you're around somebody and they gossip about everybody else, well, you know they'll gossip about you. Um, if they if they are narrow-minded or quick to judge, then they're not going to be the sort of people that you want around in your deepest times. If they're open with their you know with their advice and it comes with good intention then that brings them trust but I think to think about it I'll the very first thing is that you're looking for somebody who has the same values as you because I think when you when you trust somebody with something deeply personal and they don't have your values then you are asking for trouble I think so I think it has to be a meeting of values and then the meeting of mindset and what your instincts are telling you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's totally, I mean, it's, it's absolutely the, at least the values of like continuous improvement or getting better and, and growth mindset and non-judgment. I mean, does the person yeah. lift you up? Do you feel better after speaking with them? Even if they've told you something you don't like, you know, if it if that is the case, then they'll put the right people to be around you. Or do they, if you've told them something, do they use that against you in the future? If they do, they're not the right person for you. You know, it's that kind. Of, are they constantly reminding you of your last failure <laughs> from a non-loving position? You know, um, you don't want them to be around you. I think. But the thing is, it's like you, it's not as if you need a lot of people either. And if you have no one around you yet, that's not the end of the world because you can do that for yourself. And as you become more open and trusted in yourself, those people will, will come. They'll turn up. I totally, yeah, that I totally agree with. And it's it's absolutely about sourcing the right few people because those few are the, the rocket fuel. And so what do you, Jude, what do you think about like those growth moments for people? Like how do people get on that journey and really start to make it move and themselves learn, like put that rocket fuel on themselves? You got to get uncomfortable because <laughs> there is no growth in the comfort in the comfort zone there is zero growth in the comfort zone you're comfortable you ain't growing <laughs> um i think if you're not used to throwing yourself out the comfort zone on a regular basis then start with something really really small so that you can go look i tried this and it worked i tried this and it worked um even if it's something like I really want to learn another language, um, so I'm going to download Duolingo, and you know, because I was rubbish at languages at school and I was, felt like I was an idiot. You know, that's still a tiny little move, but it could be quite significant in your confidence levels. So, yeah, I would say push yourself out there. Find even if it's a tiny thing, um, try that, and when you're ready. Go to somebody you trust and ask them. You know, it's one of the one of the hardest questions could be, Rob, what do you think I need to do to get me to do this? <laughs> and then say to yourself, if it's reasonable, I'm going to do it. You know, it's a bit like 
prior to the lockdown, I had pathological fear of going on camera, which is bizarre. Because I can stand in front of a thousand people and do a talk, right? And no <laughs> problems. Put me in front of a camera, I was like, you know. And uh, there was this guy, uh, a good friend of mine called David Chislett, and he said, do you, do you just need to do it? Just, just do it. And I was like, oh, I'm scared. And he goes, I'll do it with you. I was like, okay. I said, you know what? Let's do a video series with 12 videos. Uh, so I just thought, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So I was like, right, let's just do it. So we did a 12 video uh, series um, together. Uh, and at, w- at one point, we were recording maybe two or three videos a month to get through this series. So by the end of it, I was just like, yeah, well, that's so cool. <laughs> but I was like, the first time I sat down, it, he was so good. He, like, I know he was amused. But he wasn't like he was very encouraging and not laughing because I was a nervous wreck, which is ridiculous. <laughs> it's absolutely stupid because I train, I talk, I do all this stuff. But I think it was the having the camera and not necessarily being able to see the reaction of the people was what I think was what was scaring me the most. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's such a small thing to be frightened to go on camera. It's a silly thing, um, and it annoyed me. Because I could logically go, this is stupid. This is actually stopping me <laughs> from growing because I cannot stand up face to face to everybody's in lockdown. I have to go on camera. So I got very pragmatic about it and said, right, okay, let's just do 12 and let's do it within three months. I was like, okay. And now I'm just like, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, right? But it's it's those things that seem trivial unlock some sort of learning opportunity. And often it's not logical, right? What we believe about ourselves or what we believe about the world. And and I think what you're getting at is like this sense of acceptance or rejection or belonging where you can't see them, therefore you're going to be rejected. And that's a very significant belief, right? But it's as you start to get out there, you can build the trust in yourself and see the results that you're getting. And I think it's just something. Yeah. F- yeah, go ahead. I'm not sure it was rejection. It's more that I work really well live. You know, I, I you know, skiff off the, the buzz, the interaction, and then not having one, which is what it was just like, oh, how, how do I, you know, it's almost like if you tell a joke, there's no one laughing. Because it's just real camera. So would it fall flat? Because I can't tell. You know, it's it's that kind of uncertainty. But it's the same way as if people are frightened of doing public speaking. And, and for me, it's like, what's there to be frightened of? So it, it's, it's, all, it's all relative, isn't it, really? But it's also a case of who do you believe you are? So, you know, having the maverick brand about pushing past comfort zones... <laughs> And, do, and just breaking the rules and doing it anyway. And then I'm sitting there going, I'm right to go on camera. It's inconsistent, you know. It, so I am not living who I am. And it got to a point where I was like getting quite a lot of cognitive dissonance about it and saying, man, that's rubbish. What kind of maverick won't go on camera? <laughs> <laughs> Stupid is that? But, it, but you're right, though, right? It's, it's being and taking that as part of you. And so yeah. it's like, I am the maverick and this is what mavericks do. And that's the part that folks need to integrate with is like, is when they start to see and construct their future leadership self, it's like, who is that person? And then it's stepping into being that person. And that's yeah. what holds us back. Because one of the things I do with, with people is, help them define the leadership identity and it's something that takes you know five and a half hours to look at the three aspects of who you are and it's really action-led and quite innovative and a lot of fun but what but once it's done it becomes like a tuning fork so it becomes something that you just do all the time um in a reflective consciousness type of way um so it's so it keeps you on the straight and narrow. And as soon as you start doing something that is not in that identity, you feel it. You start. You feel uncomfortable. You know, because you it gets to the point you just go, "This isn't, this isn't right." And that can be a really great way of making sure you stick to the things that are right for you, and you're putting your 
own identity and impact in the right places. And so what are those three elements that you focus folks on? Okay, so the first one is looking at like your leadership proposition, I call it. So you're a leader, so what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? And what are the, the processes that you do? So I strongly believe we all run processes all the time, but we don't actually know what they are, but they are guiding us. And if we don't do the, the processes that we that we're doing correctly, it won't work. So mine is strategize, innovate, execute. It doesn't matter if I'm at work or at home, because any time I have seen any input, my first point is, what's the point? Why are we doing, you know, I start strategizing. Then I go, oh, what kind of cool thing can make this happen better? And then I go, right, let's get it done. I do all the time. But knowing that's what I do really hones how I do the stuff and how I articulate it to people. Um, the next is the leadership impact. So what's the impact you're providing to people and how do you nurture that and magnify that impact? And then that gets integrated into the proposition. And then the third one is looking at the talent. So what is it that you are really good at? You've always been really good at it. And when you're not doing this thing, uh, you're failing. So it's like your personal success strategy or your behavioral dna and when you integrate all of that together it's extremely powerful um people i've worked with i've seen them get you know massive pay rises suddenly being uh the impact is suddenly gone absolutely crazy they it's not about yes you become more confident because of it but it's not concentrating on those behavioral things it's concentrating on what is your identity and how do you make that identity work for you and others so how would you describe your identity? I would say that I am a strategic innovator because I'm always dynamically focused. So it's always, it's like somebody said to me the other day, think about you, Judith, you're kaboom. I went, like, what do you mean kaboom? It sounds like I'm a toy story. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like everything is just pow. It's just but it's nuanced, you know what I mean? It's like the catalyst that starts it off and then watches it go. And I think my leadership identity is, is what you could say I've been called um, the satnav, the maverick satnav, because we will get to the destination. We may have to reroute a few times, but we're getting there. You know, you're not lost on the process. We're just rerouting. You know, take a U-turn here. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know, it's, and that's where all the strategy, innovation, execution comes from. You know, it's like, I'm very much just saying, where are we going? When they go here, okay, let's get here. Um, whereas I think a lot of times people are more concerned with the process of getting here so that when they hit an obstacle, they can't overcome it because it's like, uh, whereas I'm like, take a left. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it's like having that, um, somebody said to me, you're the calm in the chaos. You know, it's like everybody else sees all this and I can see really, that's part of my leadership identity stuff, I can see really, really clearly the path where I'm like, yeah, 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 that might be happening like this, but this, just do this and, and we'll get there. And I think that's that's my identity, you know. Well, we will get to the destination and we'll have a lot of fun doing it. Um, and obstacles are just, you know, curious things to to walk over or jump over or crawl under, but they're not stopping us. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's an incredible gift to have. And I, I think what you're you're showing is the difference between people knowing themselves as leaders and the people who are very much trying for control. Oh yeah. What can you control? You know, that's it's it's what it's that's why that's why I ponder constantly, you know, is there is there a need? It's like is the job that I do worthwhile in the sense of like, you know, in this, it's like, a, that's kind of what keeps me honest in a way. So if there was a zombie apocalypse, right, or if there was a thing that happened and there's no more internet, right? So there's no more Wi-Fi. We're all back to cooking in the woods. What's my purpose? Do you know what I mean? And it's like, if you can't figure it out, I don't say I've totally figured it out yet, but I'm working on it. 
then you're probably not doing the right thing, isn't it? It's like, and I'm thinking what I would probably do would be switching into the internal leadership more than the external. There's still be external leadership because I think that would still be needed, but that whole kind of knowing what you do because to be maverick and to stand out in a, an apocalyptic kind of scenario is something that will be needed, you know. Um, so it sounds, like, it sounds like I'm really weird and strange, but being pathologically curious is pre-thinking what you would do, you know, and I think if there are so many people, and I used to see it a lot when I was in corporate, who are doing jobs that the jobs don't actually even need to exist. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, I don't see the point of them. Um and unfortunately, the people in the jobs often feel the same point, and that's why they're not engaged. And if you and sometimes it's the story of the job that's wrong. So the job is really vitally important, but it's been left to seem like it's unimportant. A bit like you know the whole story about the stone stone maker. He's sitting there, and he's going, "I'm building." You know, I'm just putting the, the the wall, and the other one saying, "I'm building the cathedral." It's that sort of thing. It's like, what's the story we tell each other, and what's the story we tell ourselves? Does that answer your question? I'm not too sure now. <laughs> it does. It's funny, right? And it's, you're totally right. A lot of it is the framing of the job, but then it's also in, especially in huge corporations, there's a lot of jobs that are either redundant or they do things that are not really value added. It's sort of like you're, you're a cog in the process. And, yeah, but it, and it's not as if the person isn't needed. It's like one of the things I used to do when I was uh, head of HR organisations would be looking at the depth of the jobs and how you round them out to interest. If the job, if you could objectively look at the job and go, it's really boring, <laughs> it's really boring. <laughs> objectively, then why would you get someone to do it? Do you know what I mean? There must be something that you can do to the job to make it. It might be. So one of the things I used to say um, in HR, there are certain things that are just... Oops. I say in HR, there are certain things that are just routine because you, you know, they work on a cycle. You know, so the things that have to happen to make sure people get paid have to happen, and they have to happen at a certain time. So let's lean out that process so it can just be done, and then we have all this extra time to do some cool stuff. So let's work out what's the cool stuff. Whereas some people go, oh, this process is what happens. All I do, oh, I'm a bit bored, so I'll make it take longer. <laughs> so that it fills up my time where I was like no let's make it shorter so you have more time and then we can do some great fun stuff that you can get engaged with so it's not about taking away the jobs that are routine because that you know until the AI is ready you know you'd have to do them but it doesn't have to take up your whole time just some of your time I love that and Jude, kind of going down the path of the future, what do you want your legacy as a leader to be? Hmm. If we had, if every single individual in the world was a maverick leader, then that'd be a great legacy because maverick leaders stand up for what they believe in. They break the rules that make no sense. They are working towards the greater good principle. Um, they are congruent and do what they say that they're going to do. And I think if we had politicians, <laughs> let's pick politicians, why not, who stood up there and what they told you was the, the truth. And if it was, it might be a hard truth, all right? but, it, but you could believe what they had to say and you knew that they were working to the greater good of the individual, the country, the world. Can you imagine how powerful that would be? And then if you could trickle that to every single relationship, whether it's a father to the child or, you know, the school teacher or the surgeon, you know, the world would be an amazing place. Um, so that would be my legacy, to get as many people working for the greater good um, in a way that's congruent and ethical. I love that. We're totally in line there. And it'd be nice if the politicians did even anything. I mean, that's another story. <laughs> and so obviously for everyone out there, Jude can be found 
I mean, one is her podcast is available wherever this one is. So the Maintenance Paradox podcast. You can also check out her website, themaverickparadox.com. And obviously she's available on LinkedIn and we'll drop a bunch of those links in the podcast notes. Is there anywhere else that you'd want folks to follow you or is there anything that you want to promote? Uh, just to, you can come follow me on the website, which is maverickparadox.co.uk. You can see it's a genuine theme that almost everything's called Maverick Paradox. Yeah, I guess I'm about to launch um, a group program for senior leaders that want to increase and amplify their leadership, leadership influence so that they can tackle real life challenges, uh, real life business challenges. So I'm about to launch that. Um, so if you if anybody's interested in going on the wait list for that, it's Judith at maverickparadox.com. Awesome. Yeah, we'll drop your email in the podcast notes so people can go check that out. For us, obviously, subscribe to Leadership Launchpad Project on your favorite podcast platform. And we've just been listed on Amazon Music. So if you want to start your day off telling Alexa to play the podcast, definitely you can do that. Um, also, for all our programs, head on over to EliteHighPerformance.com and you can find us all there. Is Jude, just to wrap up here, is there anything that you'd like to leave our listeners with? You are more powerful than you know, and how you use that power determines who you are as an individual. Oh, I love <laughs> that one. That's an incredible one. And for me, I'd like to echo that statement and just say that it's all about how you perceive who you are. And it's what we've talked about this whole show is deconstructing the shoulds and the not use and the conditioning and the managers and the firefighters and all these parts of you that weren't supporting your true big S self. And so once you find that big S self inside you, you're going to be all powerful and ready to rock and roll. Jude, thanks for joining us this week. Hey, thank you so much, Rob. I don't believe you managed to get me to say all of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have that effect on folks. So it, it's <laughs> it's one of my superpowers. And, and actually, just a, a plug, um, I was on obviously the maintenance paradox podcast so the maverick paradox the ma sorry the, the maverick <laughs> paradox podcast and so if you you want to check that one out it would have been a few weeks ago you can head on over there and find my interview there and then also get sucked down the rabbit hole of all the other ones <laughs> that, that jude's put out so definitely check those out everyone thank you so much for listening and we'll see you all next week <laughs>